Good morning. Thanks, Paul, for the introduction. Hope everybody's well. Uh, I literally just walked off the field, so kind of feel like this is post-practice interviews out there like normal. So hopefully sooner than later, we'll be able to get back to that. But as Paul alluded to, 11 practices in, a um, little bit different schedule this year. Uh, we modified some things. Went instead of three weeks during the winter quarter, we went two weeks, give us our time, a little bit more time in the weight room and, and obviously with the coordinator change. We then, as we always do, take finals and spring break off, which is normal. And then um, we were asked to onboard for a week. So uh, a little bit longer extended spring practice. We're in the middle of our three week phase here of practices with one more to go on Saturday. So we're, we just wrapped up number 11 and we'll have 13 through 15 next week. So, um, you know, kind of a little bit longer grind uh, for the guys, but, uh, you know, I thought today in particular may have been one of our more enthusiastic, more spirited practices. Uh, and uh, I, I just really feel that this group's really starting to come together. You know, it's been a very still abnormal type of way that we have to go about our daily business and uh, the guys have handled it incredibly well. You know, have some, some new faces uh, you know, with the early enrollees with Sully and, and Jacob and and Mac uh, and and, and uh, AT3 and with Trey. So, you know, those guys are, are are molding and meshing in well. As always, our our upperclassmen have done a terrific job welcoming welcoming them to the family and then, you know, really helping them through the process. Uh, Ryan was able to enroll uh, and and started uh, getting some experience as a quarterback when we got back for the spring quarter. So he's been, what, four practices, five practices with us. Uh, and then, you know, to add back, uh, you know, Jason Whitaker, Jason Gold, Sam Duke Miller, uh, you know, again, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a bit of talent there that I just mentioned. So, uh, you know, you add that with the group that we have coming back, a lot to be excited about and a lot of work ahead of us. Not only these next four practices, but then we will uh, hit it hard in May, uh, as we always do. So. Um, off to a good start and uh, a lot of competition. No jobs will be won in spring. So if you're going to ask me who our starting quarterback is, I will mute my line uh, and you can do, do your own articles. But uh, a lot of work to be done uh, and, and a lot of excitement ahead for, for 21. So uh, really liking the group at this point. So with that, I'll answer any and all questions that you all have. Paul Banks. Good morning, Pat. Happy spring football season. Happy day after a White Sox no hitter. Sure. Yeah, that was pretty sweet. Yeah, great, great, great story with Carlos for sure. No doubt. Uh, my question is about uh, Rashawn Slater and Greg Newsom. Uh, they're both ranked, you know, right near the top of their position groups in this draft class. Um, all the information's out there about their measurables and their tape and all that stuff. But I want to know what about these two guys as a person, like an NFL team who selects them, who who are they getting in terms of the person on the inside and Rashawn and Greg? Well, I'll start with Rashawn, Paul, you know, a young man from Houston, Texas, um, that, that, you know, unfortunately for his high school experience, maybe they didn't win a lot of games, but you could tell that they were changing the culture of the high school football team when he was, when he was there. And when you went and watched him practice, there was one lead, you know, there was one guy that jumped out. It was him. And, and, it was athletically, it was size. It was the person that he was when he got in the building, everybody loved and adored him. You know, great family and uh, a very, you know, a professional family. You know, his dad having a great NBA career. And he came in here right away, uh, ready to go, ready to compete. Uh, you know, earned a starting role as a freshman. And then obviously had an illustrious career. Uh, you know, you've probably seen the videos and that's who he is, right? He's a humble guy. Uh, but when he steps on the field, that humility goes away. And, and, and he's a physical, talented, light on his feet. Uh, high compete level guy that is got an, an incredibly, I think, high ceiling moving forward. Uh, you know, again, with only playing three years for us. So, I, you know, the, the, the feedback I've gotten, you know, I, you know, is he going to be the first guy off the board? I think that's going to be an exciting storyline uh, at the offensive line position. If he's not, he'll go pretty quickly, you know, I think uh, there uh, after that. And then, you know, Greg, obviously, uh, Glenbard North, uh, you know, the, our tradition there that we've had, the great players that we've had from there. He'll be our second NFL player, uh, you know, in my time uh, that's played for Ryan Wilkins. And, uh, you know, then obviously Greg goes down to IMG for his senior year. Um, but, you know, he and his mom and his family were adamant that they were going to be loyal to their commitment. 
A lot of other schools came in and recruited him and his character stayed true to what they said and he stayed committed to us. And it, it just, it kept going from there, right? Great leader in the back end, great playmaker, uh, very high football IQ. I believe, you know, from a football IQ standpoint, he can not only be a corner, but also be a sub nickel player, uh, you know, and move inside. He's got the physicality to be able to do that. And then I think with him, you get passion, right? You see it on the field. You see, it shows up on tape. You know, that wasn't the, the fake juice that some young men have. He, he's a passionate player. Both guys are complete. Both guys are ready to go. They're, they'll be ready to start day one when they walk into an organization. And uh, both guys are bona fide first rounders. And we're really incredibly proud of them. Uh, both will walk out of here, obviously, with their degree. Uh, and, that, and that's what it's all about. They're prepared for life. They're prepared for the NFL. And we couldn't be more proud of both those guys. Do you think this might be the most exciting NFL draft night or NFL draft weekend for the program of your tenure or maybe ever? I don't know. I get pretty stoked up in all of them. I'm, a, I'm excited to be going. So I'm, I'm going to the draft. Uh, I'm excited to be there with those guys to support them. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully have more guys' names called as the draft goes along. But uh, I'm, I'm excited. You know, I didn't get my name called. So I can't – I'm going to – I'm just going to soak it all up and, and uh, I'm going to be uh, – you know, I'm not going to be a head coach that day. I'm going to be a fan. I might be asking some of these other dudes for autographs with my guys. So it's going to be fun. Thanks, Vince. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Dave Ennett. Coach, good morning. Uh, what, what kind of benefit is there, the fact that these guys are in the conversation, that there's been so much attention on Rashawn and, and to Greg also? Are, are you getting any kind of positive results from that just the the attention that's bringing to to the fact you've turned out guys like this yeah good morning mr cat absolutely you know young men want to get a great degree for that that we recruit want to get a great degree from a great school they want to play championship football they want to be developed for life and they want to be developed for the nfl and we've had a ton of nfl players during my time i think last year was the most that we've had in program history as we started training camp and now to have you know two first rounders i think shows every prospect in the country that, that you can come to Northwestern and you can have it all. And, um, you know, just really proud of the development that our, our nutrition staff, our strength staff, our AT staff, sports psych, sports science, our assistant coaches that we've put around. And we've had that motto to be the best player development staff in the country. And you can come here and have a top 10 degree, play top 10 football and go on to play in the national football league and, and get first round money and first round opportunities uh, yeah, I don't know if there's anywhere better right now to be playing that than, than with us. I know I'm a little biased, but uh, I, I think it just, I, what else more do you want? I, I just don't, I don't know what else more you'd want as a prospective student athlete. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Go ahead, Louie. Hey, Fitz. Good to see you. Um, I got a question about uh, Ryan Holinsky. You know, what, what have you seen from him so far, both as a quarterback and, and as a potential leader? You know, what has he done on the field and what has he done? You know, how is he relating to guys in the locker room? Yeah, sure, Louie. Good morning. I uh, hope all's well. I, I think he's come in, you know, like the other transfers that we've had at the quarterback position, just really humble with an open mind, uh, working hard to build relationships, learn the offense. Uh, he's made a couple of plays in practice and, and demonstrated some passion and juice. And I think our defense has appreciated that. Uh, you know, any of the, any of you that have come out to practice, especially when we get going competitively, you know, the, the passion, I don't, I don't, I don't get overly upset about a lot of passion at practice and uh, to see Ryan kind of jump right into it. Uh, I, I, I think the guy's liked, so, you know, he's, he's what five practices in, um, you know, it, it's unfare to have any assessment, right? I mean, at, at this point, but he's doing everything he can to learn the system and, he, and he's competing and, and trying to, you know, remember who Coach Anderson is and, you know, and, and uh, you know, who, who Coach, he knows who Coach Bajakian is, but he's, uh, he's done a really terrific job. We're excited to have him in that room and excited to have him competing. From a leadership standpoint, probably a, a really good question for me, probably in training camp partner. I think he's just learning guys' names and the waters east, the city south, and and uh, you know, uh, you know where uh, Lunt Hall is, and and all that stuff, and Sergeant Hall, and Bob, and all that. So, thanks. Yeah, hope all is well. Ben Chasen. Hey, Coach. Um, I think 
a lot of us following the program have seen a lot of Twitter announcements of official visits in June. Um, I just want to know, especially with Rashawn and Greg and also with the recent success, has there been any shift in, in, in the pitch in the last year or so? I'm um, looking forward to those visits. Is there going to be any sort of different approach or are you going to keep at it the way you have? Yeah, Ben, good morning. Um, at, well, I mean, I think the narrative is written based on the success that you have. You know, there's I'll go back to the mid nineties when, you know, coach Barnett was talking about belief without evidence. Right. And that was to have faith. You got to have faith when you come here someday, we're going to win. Right. And, and now we have the evidence, you know, two out of the last three years, we won big time West championships. You know, we've won four straight bowl championships now to have uh, you know, on the eve of two first round picks of, of young men that maybe weren't, uh, you know, top 100 players in the country coming out of high school to show the way that we can develop our young men. Uh, again, the, the, the credit goes to them. I mean, they've put the work in, they've bought into what we do and how we do things. And uh, I think the, the, the pitch change is just honesty, open up the hood, show young people, you know, what the engine looks like underneath that, that drives this development process. And then most importantly, Ben, you know, finally getting recruits around our players. You know, I, that's been the issue that I, you know, and they get around Walter Athletic Center and, and Ryan Fieldhouse and Wilson Field and Hutchinson Field and Martin Stadium and, and around what we have infrastructure wise, we can bring that to them virtually. It's different live, right? It's different when you're able to walk around and get on campus and all that. Uh, the, the biggest issue for me, in my opinion, has been the inability for us to get our guys live with, with prospective student athletes. So that's really what I'm most excited about. Just, you know, telling the truth and, and getting them around our guys. Matt Fortuna. Hi, Fitz. Where, why do you think you guys have had such a successful pipeline of guys who go to the NFL scouting community and work for NFL front offices? Is that by design? Uh, what, what do you think it is about your place that, that these guys have naturally gravitated for there? Yeah, Matt, hope all's well, buddy. Thanks for being on this morning. Well, we, uh, we've, we've had a great run. I mean, it, it kind of started as a slow trickle. I'll go back. Uh, you know, when I got a couple of great teammates in, in Lee Gisson Daner and Justin Shabbat that, uh, you know, really kind of started that going. And then it just seemed like as we got more and more guys into that pipeline that were doing a terrific job in, in multiple organizations, I'm starting to get calls from general managers, not only about our, our players, but I was also getting calls uh, from director of college scoutings and general managers about my staff. And, you know, maybe I'm a little bit different than other head coaches. You know, when I talk to and do like end of the year reviews, I talk about three, five and 10 year plans with it, with our staff. And, and when a young man says, or, or, or a young woman that's been on our staff says that, Hey, listen, I have aspirations going to the, the NFL just like we do in our, our mentor program and our player development program for our players, I do the same thing for our staff. And I tap them into that great group of, of people that we have in the NFL. So um, the credit goes again, like to our, uh, to Rashawn and Greg and our other draft eligible guys, our guys buy in and they do a great job developing, right? Well, our staff members are the same way. They come here, they work their tails off. They show up first, they leave last. They bust their tails. They learn how to network. Um, they they work hard. We we you know when when Cody uh, was has been in the role, we'll, we'll do some you know we'll get them out uh, the other guys and, and women out uh, to do professional development and they'll, they'll shadow people. They'll do written reports. Um, and and uh, you know there's just been I think a, a a great pipeline started. But then once everybody gets in, they're, they're kicking butt and we're we're really proud of them. I, I tell them all. When they leave here, don't forget about our, our, our coaching staff now. We got some great head coach potential here. Forget about hiring some of these guys as potential head, head coaches down the road. So that'll be fun someday. Can that, I don't know how you would incorporate that in a recruiting pitch, so to speak, with guys who obviously want to play in the NFL. But I mean, is that, has it reached a point now where that's something you talk about with prospective student athletes as far as just entry points into the NFL through different avenues? Well, I talked to him just about our relationships with the NFL, and, and that's part of that. It's one of the variables, Matt, that, you know, is a big part of that. When I talk and I, I have a slide that I show all the former Wildcats uh, that are now in scouting, front office, um, different roles in the National Football League, it's, it's beyond just the players, right, in this big, you know, NFL process. And so, you know, that's a big deal. Like when we had Pro Day here, it was it was like a family reunion, all the, all the Wildcats that were here, and then 
uh, there were a couple of guys that couldn't make it because they had other responsibilities at other pro days. And, you know, they, I got, I got scouts from other team. Hey, where's your, where's this guy? Where's this woman? Why aren't they here? And, you know, I'm not setting their schedules anymore, so I don't know, but it's, uh, it's definitely something I look forward to. And when we have our practices that are open uh, and, and those uh, that are, have Wildcat and their blood come back through, it's, it's always a lot of fun and, and we're really proud of them. Drew shot. Hey coach, hope all is well. Um, I've spoken to some members of the 2021 recruiting class and who echo a lot of the stuff that you're saying about the program on the rise and how they really bought into the vision of where this program is going. Can you speak about what you were looking for in this specific 2021 class and how you feel they have a potential to impact the program? Um, so those are the guys we've already signed, correct, Drew? To, to make sure I'm saying the same, same class you're talking about. Oh, sorry. Yeah, some of them are early enrollees. I haven't spoken okay, to yeah, yet, so the, it's okay, the same yeah. class. It's Absolutely. the class you currently yeah. signed. Right. So, oh, well, first it starts with needs, right? You, you're looking at this year's graduating class, and then you're looking at what you may need a couple of years down the road if you're going to offset, you know, you're kind of 41-41-3, right? 41 offense, 41 defense scholarships, three for the specialists. And then, you know, we, you break it down even a little bit further within the positions. And, you know, if there's one year you feel like uh, maybe we need a little bit more competition in a room, we may take an extra guy. Um, I'm, I'm just being hypothetical here, right? Maybe we need an extra DB in this class or an extra wide receiver, even though we started the class saying we were going to take three, maybe we feel like we got to take four. So, you know, it starts there with, with kind of the, 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 the math behind it. And then it's about building relationships and, and then thinking about guys where we're, we're way beyond talking about, Hey, we hope you can come here to compete, you know, compete and maybe you'll get on the field. We're, we're only recruiting guys that we believe as a staff that are going to come here from day one to compete to start. Now, whether or not they do or not, that's going to be determined once they arrive, but when, you know, ultimately here at Northwestern, the only person that has the ability to offer a scholarship is me. I don't believe in the 10 independent contractor assistant coaches. Uh, they are in charge of their areas. They are in charge of their positions uh, and they're and building their recruiting boards with our recruiting office. But when you get offered a scholarship here, it's offered by me. And so, you know, we want to dig as deep as we can on the who the person is and whether or not they're going to fit our locker room first obviously our campus community, our academics, and then whether or not we believe they're going to come here to compete to start. So, um, you know, we've been that kind of in this place now for a handful of years. And I think that's why you're seeing more impact players come and start or play or be significant contributors right away. I do think we're going to see more of that as we move forward. And then, you know, as we go into this new world with the, with the, the, the automatic ability to transfer, you know, obviously we all have to adapt, you know, I'm, I'm doing my projections on where things are going to have to go and, you know, the, the new, the new, the new world is going to be, you're not going to sign, you know, 15, 20, 25 high school players anymore. You know, you're going to maybe sign 12 high school players and five transfers or, you know, you, you get where I'm going on that. So, uh, and that's going to be, you know, different each year based on your needs. So uh, there, there's definitely a new frontier we're going to, we're going to go into. We're fully going to embrace it and um, we're, we're, we're going to adapt and evolve and, we're going to do everything we can to have every year be uh, to have our football program prepared to compete and win championships every year. Daniel Olinger. Hey coach. Good to see you this morning. Um, last year, like around this time in spring football practice, you know, it was obviously different, but you had mentioned how you guys are doing a lot of drills on defense to try and create more turnovers, how in 2019 season, that was like the one thing you guys really thought you needed to improve on. Obviously last year's defense was excellent. Maybe the only thing you guys referenced as a struggle was sometimes stopping quarterback draws, assigning quarterback runs, scrambles. Have there been any kind of drills to try and work on that or specific like ideas, mindset, whatever it is, just to try and address that? Yeah, Daniel, first of all, it's just recognition, you know, by the defensive line of, of what's called a short set, right? Instead of the offensive linemen going their normal drop or their, their normal pass set, you know, typically it's a one-step pop. You know, there's certain things that we looked at and starts up there, right? We got, we got to be able to recognize that. Number two, you stop, draw, screen, and reverse through communication. And so our guys that are the twos, guys on the sideline, myself, our defensive staff, the guys on the field, need to recognize those plays and communicate them. And then third, you, you, once you recognize it, you've got to be able to fit it right and, and, and get off blocks and, and, and tackle. So 
Um, you know, some of those plays, you know, you got to, you got to kind of, you know, you got to tip your hat. They got a good scheme. They got us in a good call and it was a good job by the offense. And then other times it's us not, not, not recognizing it, not communicating it and then not executing. So absolutely. We work it, you drill it. Um, and, uh, you, you try to improve on, on all those things that you didn't have success on the year before. So that's definitely something that we'll, we'll continue to work on and, and, and probably work on every year, but, uh, definitely a point of emphasis. And last question for Will Carmen. Hey, Coach. Good to see you. Um, I know, on draft circles and mock drafts online, it's sort of taken a while for Greg and Ray Sean's draft stock to really take off. I guess I'm wondering, for you when you're communicating with NFL personnel, has it been sort of after the season their stocks have really risen or all along? Has it been like that? Obviously, with Ray Sean, you told him you advised him not to play this year or you thought it would be in his best interest. So I'm sure you saw that somewhat coming. Yeah, well, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's so it's great, and I love our our friends in the media that cover cover the draft. I mean, how fun is it? Like post Super Bowl, all we talk about is the draft. Like it, it's 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 awesome. If you like are a draft junkie, I mean, it's incredible, and you can go like everywhere to get it. So, uh, right, there's narratives in that world, and 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 that kind of gets to become, I guess you'd say, quote unquote, the mainstream uh, perception. Then we get to draft weekend, and then reality sets in. And that reality I'm talking about is I'm going to go back two years ago. I started getting asked about Rashawn and about, about Greg, right. And, and more guys, frankly, but when you start at, at, at this level, you start in the big 10 uh, and you're an underclassman and you pop off the tape, the way both of those guys did as underclassmen, of course, scouts are going to start asking me about them. And, and so uh, th these guys were known in the NFL circles a lot earlier, maybe than it is in the mainstream media. But then it, more importantly, once they got recognized of potential NFL players, their play went up. And once that play, uh, you know, the, the production, the, the consistency uh, went up, now all of a sudden, now you start talking about, yeah, you're going to get drafted. To, wow, he might be a day, t a day three to maybe he's a day two. Now all of a sudden, oh, my goodness, you start comparing them to really what's available. You know, these guys, you're talking about potentially the best at their position in the entire country. And uh, so, like I said earlier, I'm incredibly proud of them. They bought into what we do. They put the work in. Their families have been incredibly supportive. Uh, and I'm really proud of our entire staff, our program of hitting that motto, of being the best player development uh, program in the country. And uh, we won't, we, there'll be no group of, of people more excited than everybody that's supporting these guys uh, on, on Thursday the 29th when they get their name called. So um, looking forward to that. Appreciate everybody being on this morning. Everybody stay healthy and safe, and uh, we're looking forward to finishing up spring ball. And if I don't, am I going to get a chance to be with everybody again, Paul? Yeah. Okay, so I guess this isn't it. So until next time, enjoy it. Enjoy it. See ya. Go Cats. get normally especially when kids leave come in and out I mean it's that it's that next stage so you need people to step up so I mean it's, it's the same thing you see all around college football but especially us I mean personally DB wise I, I don't want to spoil it I don't want to give it any secrets at all but no I definitely feel really good about the future of Northwestern and the terms of players we're bringing in because as we said the culture's changing 
we're trying to be that top team. So we got to make it known early. Yeah, we're here for us. We really don't care. So. Through shot. Hey, AJ. Uh, your new D coordinator, Jim O'Neill, he came from Vegas as a secondaries coach. What has that been like for you as a cornerback, having a coach who's very familiar with the role that you play? How has that been? I mean, honestly, it's been good. I really love being able to pick Coach O'Neill's brain. And then the, having a defense coordinator come from the NFL, he's been able to teach us some tips and some tricks of things you see in the NFL in terms of route coming uh, recognition, stuff like that, and just little stuff, teaching us how to play certain techniques and then just really believing in us. And the one thing I kind of really like about Coach O'Neill, he, he loves talking football. So in terms of just picking his brain, that's one of the biggest things I feel like has been an advantage for us. Because we, we all know we had a good secondary last year, but in terms of just being, we want to be known as the best secondary. I feel like he's been able to provide tools to us that we would need and, <laughs> and just really help us reach that next level and just I'll honestly just make us put more trust in ourselves. So, Go ahead, Louie. Hey, AJ, thanks for being here. Um, I got a question for you. Just can you give us a sense of how different things are under Coach O'Neill this spring, like both in terms of scheme and his coaching style compared to Coach Hank? I'm going to be honest. I mean, uh, we're just flying to the ball. Everything's about the ball. We're trying to get turnovers. I mean, as you heard talking to Coach Fitz, we're putting a big emphasis on getting the ball. Get the ball, give it to the offense, we score touchdowns, bottom line. So if we find a way to get the ball, be physical, trust ourselves, play fast, I mean, that's really the biggest thing. So we've been trying to just just make things a lot simpler, make it just make it be able to play fast, be able to trust our players and just really let that thing fly. Cause at the end of the day, it's just football. I mean, that's what we came here to do, play football and win games. So he's really helped with things like that, simple enough and just trust, making us trust ourselves. How about like personality wise, coaching style? How, how does he differ from Hank? Uh, okay, I would say, one, obviously, <laughs> the age is a little bit different. So in terms of <laughs> juice, hey, Coach Hank's the GOAT. I'm not, I'm never, I would never talk bad on Coach Hank. But in terms of injury of Coach O'Neill, Coach O'Neill is really, a, he's a Jack guy. When I say Jack, you could just really see it in his eyes. He really cares and he really has that passion. And that's what really makes me connect with him. Because I'm, as you guys know, I'm a very energetic guy. And things like that, I feed off of energy like that. So when you see your coach is what, probably like 40 or 50 being just as juicy as you, you're like, wow, man. Why, why wouldn't I, you know what I mean? So it's just stuff like that. And not saying Coach Hank was never juicy, but it's just, that's one thing I've kind of noticed personally for myself that I've really grown to love and appreciate. Thank you, yes, appreciate sir. it. Thank you. Will Carmen. Hey AJ, can you sort of talk about the impact Greg had on you um, while you were kind of with cornerback uh, with him? Yeah, so uh, this is actually funny. Uh, so when I first, Took my official visit to Northwestern. Greg was my he was my host, and it was it was always funny. I used to joke with him. He's actually younger than me, but I knew that day we came in. The one thing he said to me, he said, "We coming in here, and we come. We got one goal. Our goal is to make it to the league. Our goal is to shut people down, and we're going to do that. We're going to be brothers. We're going to be close to it all, but we're going to work." And that's one thing I kind of cherish about Greg. He always had that mindset that I'm the best player on the field, and he's allowed us and transferred through the DBs that why not like why not us have play with that chip on your shoulder, especially Northwestern. We already don't get the recognition we need. So, you know, I mean, that's why I kind of took a favor into Greg and I still take a favor to this day. Me and Greg talk almost all the time. So that's the one thing I really loved about Greg and it's been an honor to play with him and pick his brain as well. Amit Malik. Hey AJ, Amit Malik with nusports.com. Um, as Ben talked about, you know, you're now kind of an upperclassman. You had some experience under your belt. I just want to ask you about the leadership that kind of you stepped into starting in spring practice. How have you felt that's been going for you so far? And then what do you think are the most important messages or themes that kind of you've been passing along to your young, younger teammates? So one, in terms of just how the leadership has changed, I remember I always used to be the young guy. So now of me being the older guy, I kind of have to not really flip how people see me, but I have to make it that I realize people are always watching me. I, I'm the older guy. So when the young dudes come in, they're like, okay, if he's doing something bad, oh, it makes it acceptable for me. So in terms of filtering things like bad ideas out, bad techniques, I try to do everything perfect and I try to be the ideal leader so that it helps out for the young dudes below. Cause in Northwest we have a standard. So I just really try to follow that standard and set that tradition so that when younger, when younger guys come in, they know we're here to work and we're here to get better at the end of the day. And what, excuse me, what was your, the second half of the question? My bad. 
Mo- mostly covered it. Just kind of like what are the most important themes that like you want to pass on or messages to like the younger guys? Personally, I just, one thing I've kind of been saying is treat every day like it's your last. I mean, we're here in spring ball. I know we're getting kind of later on in the practice, but really what I've been trying to tell the guys in the meeting room and just at, after practice is when I say treat every practice like it's your last is when come out there, try to pick one thing you can get better at. If you pick one thing you can get better and take that each day, don't think about, oh, I'm ready for practice to be over. Think about come out there and attack it. What am I going to get better at today? If you attack that, who knows? By the time the season starts, you have 10 things that you're good at, and it's just that much easier. And at the end of the day, it's just playing football. You're reacting. So that's one thing I'm just trying to say. I mean, I mean, it's just, it's just football. There's no reason to overcomplicate it, you know? We're just out here having fun. But yes, sir. Paul Banks. Hey, AJ. Uh, I just kind of want to follow up on something earlier mentioned you know, with, with Greg. The chip on the shoulder is a big part of why he succeeds and everything. And that made me think back to last fall when uh, I think Joey Galloway made the fighting Reese Davis's comment. And Greg, Greg was one of the most like outspoken guys, you know, kind of denouncing that. And he had a lot of fun with that. So my question is, do you think that's a huge part of why you know, here we are a couple weeks out from the draft. We're talking about Greg, you know, being going in the first round. Do you think that's a big reason about how he's come as far as he has is that constant, you know, wanting to prove people wrong mentality? I'm going to be honest. I, I said it earlier, Greg, there was not – Greg thinks he's the best at everything, no matter what it is. And that's and that's why I love Greg. Like, we're playing a video game. He thinks he's the best at that. But it's just that chip on his shoulder. He takes everything personally, and he wants to be the best, and he wants to win. And I feel like that's definitely a big reason. And that's one thing I've been trying to transfer over to the young guys. And I'm really glad, I'm really glad that he transferred over to me because when you play with that chip on your shoulder, that why not me, it, it really takes you to a, a, a totally different level. And I'll say, I totally agree. That's why he's there. Obviously technique and working out all that other stuff. But in terms of his mindset, I feel like that's been one of the biggest things that's allowed him to take, reach that next level and really separate himself and get the respect that he gladly deserves. Thanks AJ. Yes, sir. Awesome. Thanks, AJ. Yes, sir. Thank you, guys. It was an honor. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, Brian. Okay, now joining us will be quarterback Ryan Holinsky. How you guys doing? Good to see everybody's faces. Good to be here. Excited to be here and uh, just blessed to have this opportunity. All right, first question for Ben Chasen. Hey, Ryan, a few things. First of all, uh, obviously, you were a very highly tied guy, highly tied guy out of high school. You started at, at, at South Carolina. You probably had your fair share of places to go. Why Northwestern? What was it about this place that, that really made you choose here? 
Yeah, um, in going into the transfer process, uh, you know, there were schools that reached out um, and Northwestern was obviously one that stood out. Um, coming into this place, there's a sense of pride that you walk around this campus with. There's a sense of um, accomplishment and a sense of, you know, I've got to do my duty, um, both in the school and both on the field. And I think Northwestern's one of a kind uh, when it comes to an academic program. Uh, they expect a lot from you uh, and a football program as well. You know, they're, they're history um, has been winning games. And that's what I want to do, um, as well as getting an education because football doesn't last forever. And Northwestern's going to set me up great for that um, life after football. So that that's definitely two of the main reasons why I came here. Um, and Coach Fitz was also a main reason. Coach Bajakian um, were really hands on in the process. Um, and they made me feel welcome. Uh, so I felt like it was a great fit for myself and for my family. And then also, when, when exactly did you get here? And, and so far in your time here, what have been your favorite things about Evanston, your favorite things about the Chicagoland area? Yeah. Yeah, I've, um, I actually visited here twice before I officially um, enrolled. I came in January when it was a little bit cold. Um, so that's, that's a big difference uh, from South Carolina. So I was, I was freezing a little bit. Um, and then I came a little bit two weeks later. I came for a weekend. Um, and then I officially got here, uh, I believe, towards the end of March or something, something around there. And um, I mean, Chicago is a great place. Evanston's a great place. Um, my two uh, people that I moved in with is Sam Jarek and Hunter Johnson. Uh, so I've established a great relationship with them. Uh, Hunter has been more than welcoming. He's been great um, helping me learn the playbook as well. And Sam, of course, is a guy that's uh, been here and he, he knows everybody. He knows the playbook inside and out. Um, he's a leader on this team. So it's been great. Uh, the locker room has been very welcoming. The wind uh, is a little crazy, uh, so it's a little breezier than South Carolina. Uh, but I, I love it here. It's a great place um, with a lot of great people around the city. And, and I feel welcome, which is even better. Drew Schott. Hey, Ryan. Coming out of high school, Northwestern was one of the schools that recruited you. Can, can you talk about the relationship during that time that you developed with any members of the coaching staff and whether that impacted your eventual decision when you were in the portal to come to Evanston? Yeah, uh, I believe I was actually talking to Berkeley Holman. Um, we, we threw a little bit after practice together and we were talking about high school um, and, and scholarships and stuff like that. And I remember Northwestern being my third scholarship offer, I believe, after Boston College and I remember establishing a relationship with Coach Fitz. Um, I remember establishing a relationship with Coach McCall. Um, and just going through that process, uh, Northwestern was always in, in my pocket. They were always you know, calling me, making sure I was doing great, um, asking about school first, asking about family. Um, and I remembered that when I answered into the transfer portal that they really cared about me as a person uh, before the athlete, which is extremely important to me. Um, and I've established, I established a great relationship with Coach Fitz back then. Um, and then throughout the transfer process, uh, I established a great relationship with him again. Um, and like I was sitting in here when he was answering questions, he's the only guy that offers scholarships. Uh, so it's, it was a big honor for me to get on a Zoom with him um, and hear him offer me a full scholarship to Northwestern. It was a great honor. Um, and I committed on the spot and I haven't looked back since. Go ahead, Louie. Hey, Ryan, Louis Vicare with Wildcat Report. It's yes, uh, good to almost meet you. Yes, sir. Um, uh, you know, off the field, what, what are some kinds of things you've tried to do to get to know your teammates and build a locker room's confidence in you even before you got here? What, what were some of the things you did? Yeah, uh, I've actually, it, it feels like I've been here for a while now because of the relationships that I have with these guys. Um, Marshall Lang, one of our tight ends, you know, he, he texted me the other day, we were going to go hang out at TG's, he said, which is Thomas Gordon's. And I'm, and I'm like, you act like I know where that is. And he's like, dude, it feels like you've been here for a minute. I'm sorry. Like, that's what it is. So um, going to dinner, whether it's with the linemen and the quarterbacks, uh, we went to Longhorn Steakhouse the other night, um, you know, whether it's watching a fight, whether it's just hanging out at an apartment and, and just talking ball and getting to know him. Um, it's something that's extremely important to me. It's something that should be extremely important to everybody on this team to get to know your teammates because those are the guys you're going out on that field with and you're going to war with. So in answer to your question, I've been trying to do everything I can off the field. And I'm going to try and get some golf, golf swings in with them if I can when we have time off. Uh, I'm going to try and do anything that I can to get to know these guys, um, know their birthday, know their favorite color, know their favorite meal, whatever I can do because that's my duty as a quarterback and that's my duty as a transfer um, to fit into the locker room. So.
Thanks. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Matt Fortuna. What do you think is how similar or how different, I guess, is what you're learning and doing now schematically to, to what you did at South Carolina? And then a second part of the question, curious if you reach out to Peter Ramsey, who was in similar shoes to you last year and who obviously had great success coming in there as a transfer quarterback. Yeah, that's the great thing about uh, football is, you know, a, a hitch is always going to be a hitch. It's always a Hank is always going to be a Hank. You know, a 10 yard comeback is always going to be a 10 yard comeback. Just people have different names for those things. Um, and Coach Bajakian, uh, a lot of the things that we run schematically are similar. Um, so when I came in first day, you know, I, I really hadn't gone over footwork with the linemen or the running backs or anything like that. But I was able to fit in well with those guys because it's stuff that I've ran. I've been around football my whole life. Um, so it just kind of second nature kind of clicked for me. Uh, so schematically, a lot, a lot of things that fit in really well. Uh, I feel like I, I, I've got the playbook down pretty good. I've got to master that playbook. So I've got a long ways to go for sure. I can always get better every single day. Um, in answer to your second question, Peyton actually reached out to me um, and he's been, he was great and during the transfer process. I was able to get his phone number, uh, talk to him about everything, uh, whether it's, you know, the locker room, what guys, you know, I, I need to approach differently or what guys I need to get to know better um, and just how his transfer process went. Um, he was more than helpful and I'm extremely grateful for Peyton um, and I wish him nothing but success at the next level, which I know he will have. Uh, and I'm excited to look forward to watching to him on Sundays. Pat Timlin. Hey, Ryan, thanks for talking to us this morning. Um, my question's just sort of more on um, Bajakian and how he's helped you get acquainted with this offense. Um, mm -hmm. What have you guys been working on? How has he been as a leader? And what has it been like learning from him? Coach Bajakian is um, – he's awesome. He's got juice. Um, I mean, when we when we go from station to station, Coach Bajakian is full on sprinting like it's a hundred yard dash, and that guy's going down the sideline. So, uh, in terms of learning the offense and uh, from an on field standpoint, Coach and I, when we got acquainted in December, um, and I actually made the transfer process in January, we we met um, every single day on Zoom, uh, trying to literally learn the offense left and right, front to back, um, and we we met every single day until I stepped on campus. Um, and he's been great. He's been great helping me learn the offense. Uh, he's been great helping me apply terms to certain things, helping me remember things like that. Coach Scott um, is our is our assistant quarterback uh, coach, and he's been helping me nonstop. I come in here and I write the script on the board. I'll call him. He's like team room, and he's like, yeah, sounds good. And he'll just help me if I have a question on something like that. Um, and it, he's been great. So everybody's been helpful. Everybody's been giving me every chance that I can get to learn the playbook uh, left to right. And I still got a long ways to go, like I said, but uh, I'm excited. I'm excited about the opportunity that I have and coach Bajakian and his mind is awesome from, from stuff. When I look at the script uh, up and down, I can tell what he's trying to do with this offense. Um, and it gets me excited and pumped every day to go to practice. Amit Malik. Hey, Ryan, Amit Malik with nusports.com. You know, we asked about kind of what you were doing off the field to, to get to know the guys, but just want to ask about you kind of off the field and your personality it kind of feels like a, an icebreaker from a college breakout group, but tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, what do you want, you know, the fans to know about you? Like, who is Ryan Holinsky to, to, to Northwestern? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, of course, um, but I'm excited to join this prestigious college, this prestigious university. Um, and I think if I wanted anybody to know anything about me is I'm an energetic guy um, that loves to be a leader, loves to take charge, um, and that brings a lot to the table. Um, I'm a family for family person first. Uh, obviously, Helinski's Hope is a nonprofit organization that my parents and my older brother Kelly run uh, after our older brother Tyler passed away from suicide uh, back in 2018. So uh, mental health is an extremely important thing to me. Uh, upon stepping on campus, I know a couple of my teammates had already asked about Helinski's Hope. Uh, so I was more than able to uh, connect with a couple of guys already on the team. Um, and if I want anything to know anything about me is I'm a person lover. I, I love uh, people. I love making people happy. Uh, and if that's with wins, then I'm going to do that. Um, and if that's with getting straight A's, then I'm going to do that. Whatever it takes, um, I'm going to be the best at. I love to compete. Uh, whether you know, uh, 
he was talking about NCAA and Greg and stuff like that. If it's Greg and, and we're playing NCAA, I'm going to beat him every time because I want to compete. If it's pool, I'm going to beat whoever it is. So I'm a, com I'm a competitor. Uh, I love to win. I'm a per people pleaser. Um, and I'm a family first guy. Will Carmen. Hey, Ryan. Um, thanks so much for speaking to us. Question for you. Coming from South Carolina, the SEC to Northwestern, the Big Ten, it's obviously early, but are there any sort of difference in sort of the culture, I guess, from a conference standpoint or even a school standpoint so far that stand out to you? Yeah, I, I, South Carolina was a great place. Um, there's a lot of guys I still keep in touch with that I love. Those guys are my brothers, of course. Uh, SEC is no joke, uh, you know, going against Bama in my second start was was an eye opener for sure. Um, it was a great opportunity to do that. And coming to Northwestern, it's no different. These guys love to compete. These guys are looking to win a championship and the energy day in and day out from whether it's a lift, a walkthrough or practice, these guys bring it. And I think that's a big eye opener to me is these guys love ball. And I can tell that Coach Fitz installs that from day one uh if you don't bring the energy you don't bring the juice you're going to get put on your butt uh that's one thing that stands out to me and of course school um i mean this is one of the top schools in the nation and uh it's something you got to work hard at just as hard as football studying a script left to back you got to study an astronomy book you know from front to back so that's what i'm doing right now i'm trying to balance both worlds and it's been great so far i haven't been overwhelmed uh but th those are the big differences that i've seen so far And last question for Paul Banks. Hi, Ryan, uh, just following up a little bit on the question about off the field personality. Uh, I read online that you're a broadcast journalism major. So um, if that hasn't changed or if that's, uh, I'd like to hear, you know, why you selected that and what yeah. you like about media ops. And then my second uh, question is just more about Holinsky's so Hope, why you started it, what the aims are, what people mm -hmm. should know about the nonprofit foundation. Yeah, uh, broadcast journalism is something that I went into because I want to stick around football uh, or sports in general uh, if football ends at some point, which it will, uh, because I just love sports. I love doing something like that. And I've been told I've had a voice for commentating. So maybe I could do something along the lines of, you know, a Tony Romo's type of thing or whatever it is. I want to be in that area. Um, and I know the Medeal School is one of the best in the country. Uh, I actually switched to a comm study major. Uh, with an emphasis in journalism because journalism classes this semester or this quarter sorry um, are offered in the morning and it would have conflict with our practices and stuff so uh, i just wanted to balance both worlds and that that was the best way to go about it uh when it comes to holinsky's hope older brother tyler passed away january 16th of 2018 by suicide um and we didn't know he was suffering that kid tyler was one of the smartest kids you'd ever know one of the happiest kids he always had a smile on his face um and we actually played Fortnite the night before. And he's like, yo, we got to play Fortnite again. And that was the last text I got from him. Um, and our family just decided that we don't want any other family to go through this trouble. We don't want any other student athlete to have to suffer in silence. We want to erase the stigma of mental health of, you know, you're, you're weak if you speak out about mental health. No, you're the strongest person that anybody could ever tell you if you talk about your mental health, because it takes a lot of guts, it takes a lot of courage uh, to go out in this world today that we live in and talk about your mental health, that you're struggling, um, that you need some help. And I think in this world, uh, you can't go through it alone. You need people on your left and your right. Um, and football is a great analogy for it. You know, you need all 11 guys. You can't run a successful play uh, with just 10 guys. So is life. You know, you can't go through life. You need your family members. You need your friends. You need your peers uh, to help you when you're struggling, to lift you up, to bear that cross for you. And I, I think that's the best way to talk about Holinsky's hope. Um, I'm extremely thankful that I have two of the best parents in the world um, that have been nothing but helpful ever since Tyler had passed away. And they are continuing to push Holinsky's Hope message. Um, and they're, they're doing Zoom calls left and right with people, trying to do in-persons as much as they can. And I've got the best big brother that's still here, Kelly Holinsky, um, who's worked his butt off. And he's just one of the best big brothers. I get to play Call of Duty with him every night, even though he's not here. Um, I get to talk to him still over the microphone and we we just talk about practice and stuff so Walensky's hope is still going and it will go on forever because we don't want Tyler's name to die um, twice so that's it yeah thanks for doing this yes sir thank you guys I appreciate everybody I'm excited to be here excited for this opportunity thank you guys thanks Ryan